pleasure today to introduce Dr. Joyce Chen. She is an associate professor at the Department of Agricultural, Environmental, and Development Economics in the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences. Um, she has a PhD in economics from Harvard, and her research focuses on uh, interest are in migration, household bargaining, human capital, uh, and her pro research program focuses on understanding migration choices and the impact of those choices on household decision making and intra-household allocation of resources. And she is here today uh, to present work on climate risks and migration in coastal Bangladesh. So join me in welcoming Dr. Chen. All right, thank you very much, Aiden, and thanks everyone for, for being here. Um, so I'll practice this, as, as many speakers do, I hope, <laughs> by saying that this is still very preliminary work, where, um, it's, as I'll show you, it's kind of a big interdisciplinary project, so we're very much still trying to wrangle all the pieces together and figure out how to talk to people across disciplines and, and understand um, what's going on. Okay. Um, so this idea of migration and adaptation is particular to um, the climate change now, but to environmental risks more generally, um, has been around for a while. You know, there's speculation that these adverse um, environmental conditions can force people to migrate. Right? To some extent, this can happen proactively, where people look around and say, you know, conditions are getting bad, let's move out of here. Right? Um, or some of this could be forced migration. Right? Uh, so there's the potential to involuntarily displace uh, millions of people, potentially, right? which is why this, this area of research has gotten more attention in, in recent years. Right? And this could occur for a variety of reasons. Could be you know, loss of, of land, could be destruction of infrastructure and capital, um, could also, for developing countries in particular, we want to look at a decline in agricultural fertility. Right? But even in the U.S., you could think of something like the, the Dust Bowl here in the U.S. would have led to a similar kind of environmental um, migration. And so um, technically we're we're not calling people who move for climate reasons refugees yet. Right? The UNHCR has not classified them as refugees yet, but there is uh, or has been litigation to that uh, to that extent. Uh, but so far it's been determined that they don't classify as, as being persecuted, right? So a couple of high profile cases, right? You know, Kiribati, right, which is of 30 some islands, all of which are within six feet of sea level. Right? So, um, this is one of the cases of uh, you know, residents suing or requesting asylum in, in New Zealand um, due to climate change and rising sea levels. Um, and you know, certainly, what we're looking at here is the likelihood that all of the people in, the, in this nation are going to have to be, um, are going to be displaced or are going to need to be relocated. And a lot of what you know, the World Bank at this point is advocating for um, New Zealand, Australia, some of these other places to try to take these people, to try to get them to, to take these people proactively, right? Arguing that it's going to be a much smoother, a much better organized process if they start allowing a flow of um, environmental migrants in now, right, proactively versus ending up, you know, where we could have a situation similar to um, what's happened with the Syrian refugees, right, where you have a massive collapse and all of a sudden a huge flood of people and um, it being very difficult to place them all simultaneously. China would be another case, so this was a profile in the um, New York Times of this um, little village uh, here um, in China that's experiencing, um, I don't know how to say it, desert desertification. 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 Okay. That sounds yummy. Not um, but you know, where the, uh, the rainfall extremes are, or rainfall is becoming more extreme, they're having more droughts um, and unable to farm in these areas. So the government is proactively moving people out of this area into um, new communities that they've established. Um, this particular profile in the New York Times suggests that it's not going very well. The economic exit opportunities are not good in this area um, and people um, are not not happy about the relocation in Louisiana actually we're doing a similar thing right this is one of the first cases so this is Dr. Katrina this little um, town here uh, at the sort of southern tip of Louisiana that's again really close to sea level um, essentially, you know, has been buffeted by hurricanes for many years, and now the, the plan is to relocate 
all of the people, you know, it's a, it's a couple hundred people, I think, in this area, a lot of them are Native Americans, so relocate the communities in their entirety. And it's sort of a um, smallish scale experiment to see how this would go, given, you know, increasing storm surges and increasing frequencies of hurricanes and things like that um, along the coast uh, in, in the U.S. And it's a lot of questions about how sustainable these communities are currently how sustainable they ever can be, right, given the, the types of storms that we've been seeing this year, we've been seeing a really bad year. Um, so this is a case where you know, they had done a lot of rebuilding and um, had a lot of mitigation efforts, and now they're just looking to, to move these communities entirely. Um, and then we'll talk, I'll talk today, of course, about Bangladesh. So this is um, just a photo from a year of particularly black, bad flooding. Um, Bangladesh, as you may know, actually has um, lots of different climate risks just on a sort of annual basis. Right? They uh, have monsoon rains, and so because of the monsoon, lots of areas flood regularly. Um, and it's not unanticipated. Uh, this would be a you know, historic flood I think, for, for this family. Um, there are also much of the countries at sea level, so they're dealing with sea level rise, a lot of saltwater intrusion, which is um, creating salinity in the soil and in the drinking water. So why focus on migration? Um, well, one, because I think it's an, it tends to be an extreme response, right? something that people only do when there's sort of no other option, right? when they don't see any other options, right? whether they happen to be in a place of advantage or disadvantage, right? migration is always sort of an extreme response. Okay, so um, looking at migration tells us something I think important about the resilience of the community. Right? And in fact, not looking, not including migration as, an, as a measure or, you know, in our measures of adaptation or resilience would sort of lead to incorrect inferences, right, because we're missing all the people who adapted or who haven't been resilient, right, because they've simply left the area. If we're looking at, you know, adaptation through you know, switching to drought-tolerant crops or something like that, but we forget to count all the people who've already left right, because of droughts, then we're sort of understating the degree of adaptation and maybe understating the degree of, or overstating the degree of resilience. And I would say, you know, this was actually my first foray into interdisciplinary research, and I've been really pleased with it um, because this is actually, a, I think, a, a situation where you have to have interdisciplinary elements right, to fully understand the, the different issues that are going on and to be able to, at some point, make some policy prescriptions right, to say this is what we think will happen in the future. We think these are the people who are going to be vulnerable. These are the ways they'll be able to adapt or not adapt. And these are the types of policies we would need um, to address that. So as I said, this is part of a large project um, funded by the Belmont Forum. It's called the Band-Aid Project. Um, and you can help this uh, website if you're, uh, if you're interested. Um, so it brings together um, you know, the earth science folks who do remote sensing, hydrologists, you know, sociologists, geographers, economists, um, looking at a variety of things. Um, as I said, Bangladesh has a unique case, right? So there's they're highly dependent on the water that comes downstream, right, from these three, it's a, it's a delta, right, so there's these three huge rivers that come down. So there are lots of transboundary issues, right, in terms of what India and China are doing with dams. Um, there's coastal erosion. Uh, yeah, storm surge and the monsoon. So um, according to IPCC projections, right, we know that um, surface, surface temperature is going to continue to increase, okay, which may be good or bad for, uh, for air culture, and in some con depending on the context. The extreme precipitation events are going to become more intense and more frequent. We're going to get more droughts and more floods. Uh, the ocean is going to continue to warm, and sea levels going to um, and then one of the things I've learned from our um, folks on the physical science side is that increased use of groundwater, which is happening um, widely in Bangladesh, there's a lot more irrigation um, in use in Bangladesh, that actually accelerates um, land subsidence, or it causes the land to sink, which then accelerates the impact of sea level rise, um, as well as the saltwater intrusion. So any 
minor storm then causes salt water to come in over the land. So some of the things we're still trying to understand about migration as adaptation is thinking about different ways in which people might decide to migrate. And I think that the responses, although we don't have the data to, to really distinguish this yet, I think the responses to, um, the migration response is gonna depend on sort of uh, not just the intensity of the, the climate event or the climate risk, but also the, the type, right? So if it's something that's um, acute or rapid onset, right, we're likely to see, like in some of these cases, right, a massive out migration that happens very quickly, very suddenly, um, which can create lots of disequilibrium problems, right, where you have massive numbers of employed people, right, spillovers that really tax local infrastructures, right, um, governments that are unwilling to take large numbers of, of refugees um, or environmental migrants. But on the other hand, with a lot of these rapid onset or acute events, right, like floods or hurricanes, a lot of times the effects can be relatively short-lived, relatively. Right? So after Katrina, right, we see recovery and we see people go back, right? Maybe not back to, to what they were at before, or maybe not back to what the area was at before, but there was a recovery, right, and people did go back. Right? Whereas if we're thinking about the cases of like Kiribati and China, right, where the desertification is happening. Right? It's unlikely that people are going to be able to return to those areas, um, at least not in the same way that, that they had previously. Okay. So things like um, you know, ambient temperature increase and increases in, uh, in rainfall variability, I think, may do some more gradual response, where people sort of, over time, this accumulates, and um, they're unable to tolerate the risk or unwilling to tolerate the risk any longer. And so we see people sort of move out in, in drips and, and, and drafts. But again, we do have this problem that there may be no recovery, where people can't ever go back. There's a more complex um, migration to, to deal with. Okay, um, another thing that can happen, right, we, which we haven't discussed here, but um, more generally, if we think about migration as adaptation in developing countries, we also have this concern, well, in developed countries too, right, where people in vulnerable areas are moving out to big cities on the coast, right? We may not actually see a net decline in, in environmental vulnerability, right? So people in Bangladesh moving, say, to Chittagong, right? That doesn't, which is a coastal city, that's not necessarily gonna help, right? They may be less vulnerable in the short term, but not in the long term. Same in the US, right? If agriculture becomes less productive in, say, Nebraska, and people start moving to Houston, right? The net increase in, in environmental vulnerability may be positive. I think we'll also see um, that you know between developed and developing countries, the use of migration as an adaptation mechanism is also quite different. Because in developed countries, I think you tend to see more migration in response to sort of environmental amenities. Right? I don't like that it's too hot here now. I don't like that it's too cold here now, and so I move somewhere else. Whereas in developing countries, you'll see it more economically motivated. Right? They're more tied to livelihood rather than amenities. Also, I think in developed countries, we tend to see more proactive migration versus in developing countries that would be more um, involuntary. All right, so what we're using in terms of data, um, and the benefit here is to be able to bring in some satellite-based data, um, which of course um, gives us you know, new measures without actually having to be on the ground. So we have a high degree of geographic coverage, um, and lots of points in time in which we can measure these things right, without having to be on the ground. It also is preferred in a lot of cases to, so there are you know, pros and cons with remote sensing data. You have the advantage of um, there are a lot fewer outages in the data, a lot less missing data, right? so satellites um, aren't impeded by much except clouds uh, in some cases. All right, versus weather stations, which can be you know, vandalized, can just have malfunctions, um, and those outages tend to be tied more to socioeconomic conditions. Um, where more remote areas or poor areas would be less likely to have their weather station online. All right, so we're going to use um, a satellite-based measure of flooding. Uh, comes from NASA's uh, MODIS satellite or MODIS mission. Um, 
which basically just looks at it's a, um, an image of an area and we can tell um, or remote sensing folks can tell you know which pixels are covered by water and which pixels are not so we're just looking at the maximum percentage of pixels in each area that are covered by water and we compare that to a dry season to try to infer a flooding. Sorry, I was just curious how big a pixel is in terms of how much land it covers. Uh, so the pixels are relatively small. I think they're, I can't remember which resolution we use. I think they're 500 meters. Maybe, you know, ideally we'd like them to be smaller, but we end up aggregating up to like a county level anyway, just because it's hard to link um, administrative areas over sure. time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, but it is a limitation, and you know, there are a lot, of, a number of remote sensing papers that try to look at ground truthing versus these satellite-based measures. And you know, there's certainly some they're incorrect as well. Um, rainfall, similarly, we have from uh, from satellite data. Um, here, this product is actually gridded, so they take um, these pixels and they try to interpolate what the rainfall would be over a different. Um, spaces in the grid, and again, we aggregate up to essentially what's equivalent to a county level in Bangladesh. Um, and we have done, we have another paper that does some comparison, uh, which is, is somewhat disheartening. We compare the rainfall measures based on satellite data versus on weather station data, um, or there was another um, gridded data set from the University of Delaware that some of you may be familiar with. We compared those three measures, and the, the Correlation between those three was actually, you know, didn't exceed 0.7, um, which was was disappointing. Um, but does suggest that it's important to um, not going to be safe. It is important otherwise to look at robustness to different precipitation measures. Um, and then we do have uh, temperature uh, data and um, data on sunlight or radiation, essentially. Uh, from the sun from weather stations uh, and then we have uh, measures of soil salinity is actually taken from soil samples um, in the coastal area or the saline uh, belt they call it um, but only at two points in time 2001 and 2009. Um, so just to give you a sense um, you know this isn't highly technical here but it does look like you can see these sort of precipitation, the variability of precipitation increasing over time. It's really highly variable um, in this context. Um, and same with uh, average temperature. You can see this trend towards warming pretty clearly. The maximum and the minimum both are increasing over time. The flooded area is just to give you some Hopefully confidence in our flooding measure, we do pick up you know these big flooded events, flooding events in um, 2004, 2007, and small one in 2010. Uh, and you can also see that the uh, minimum here is not zero, right? So it's just consistent with there being a standard level over a normal level of flooding in, in Bangladesh. I don't hear axes of labels. No laziness. <laughs> Um, and here's another just a satellite image from um, this is in, uh, uh, 2000, so you can see the same map of Bangladesh and that water inundation, the cyclone. Okay, so first we're going to look at, before we get to migration, I want to look a little bit at other adaptation mechanisms again, because I think migration tends to be sort of a last resort. Okay, so first I'm going to look at um, agricultural production. Um, and here we have, you know, 87% of rural Bangladesh is dependent on agriculture, um, including, you know, a large proportion of that on rain-fed crops. Yeah. Although, again, that's changing because there's a lot more irrigation now. Um, so we have data here from the um, Household Income and Expenditure Survey that's done by Bangladesh Statistical Bureau information on crop production, um, crop area, and then total revenue, both for um, rice and uh, for fish. Bangladesh has three um, seasons, essentially, for, for growing rice. So we'll look at that seasonal variation as well. We'll be able to control for some demographic and socioeconomic characteristics 
um, like the um, features of the homes or whether it has a permanent roof and permanent walls, whether they have um, pumped water or um, well water, and whether they have a, what type of latrine they have. So, you know, this data, again, are imperfect. Um, it, so we don't have a panel, right? We don't observe the same households over time. We don't have a lot of detail about what they're doing, right? About um, exactly how they're cropping, what seed variety they're using, and things like that. Um, what we do have is the benefit of this broad-based coverage. So these surveys done by the Statistical Bureau are nationally representative. So I think um, that advantage, you know, gives us a better sense of what's happening around So it's pretty simple here. We're just going to regress um, seasonal yield or, or revenue on a variety of climate measures um, and sociodemographic characteristics. Um, and I'm going to include in there controls for um, underlying differences in, in climate across areas. So the, um, for all of these um, climate measures, temperatures and the minimum and the maximum, sunlight, rainfall, flooding, um, all of those I'm going to include both the, the long run average, so the 30 year average, and the 30 year standard deviation. And so to account for differences in, in levels and, and variability across areas. Um, so as salinity, as I said, we just have the two points in time. Um, and I also put in here um, the date that the monsoon starts, which is important for rain fed crops, right, because people put the seeds in the ground and if the monsoon comes late, um, that has a big adverse effect. All right, an important caveat here is that you know, we're, I'm not an agronomist here, and actually one thing we lack in the project is an agronomist. So these are not, you know, we shouldn't read these estimates as reflecting agronomic conditions. These are just kind of what household, this is the total response of household, right? Both how climate conditions are affecting growing, right, as well as you know, the way crops grow, as well as what they're doing to adapt and, and mitigate these uh, climate events. All right, so um, the other thing we'll see is that accounting for the fact that households make decisions whether or not to engage in any cropping in each, in each season makes a big difference. Right? So these are estimates using OLS, right, where we don't account for the fact that some households choose not to crop in a particular season. This is, sorry, this is for the main uh, rain fed season in Bangladesh, the Amman season, okay, where the seeds are put into the ground before the rains come and then it's primarily rain fed. So here we see all the climate measures have relatively small effects. Nothing's really statistically significant. When we account for the fact that households are making that decision about whether to grow this crop at all or not, then we see the big effects come in. So heat extremes right, actually have an adverse effect on crop yields, flooding also. Um, rainfall is good. But again, you know, I won't um, pretend to, to fully understand what all of this means. All right? Again, without an agronomist, which is, is somebody that we really need, it's still hard to infer how much of this is sort of you know, physiological for the crops versus how much of this is households adjusting what they're doing optimally. Okay, so this, this is season specific, as I said, for the main crop that's, that's rain fed. If we look, um, If we look uh, overall over the course of a year, okay, then rice yields and, and crop revenue are both um, decreasing in rainfall and in extreme heat. Right? So if you remember before, in the seasonal crop, actually, we didn't see much effect of rainfall in here, just this one. Right? And the other, um, other quantiles didn't, um, weren't significant. And I should mention, we use quantiles here to uh, allow for nonlinearity in the effects. Um, so it, it seems that over the course of a year, right, households are doing a lot to account for climate variation right, and environmental variability. And they're you know, making pretty good adjustments right, to sort of mitigate these risks. Um, and we see that flooding is significant for um, crop yields, but not for revenue. So maybe they're offsetting, so suggests that they're offsetting price fluctuations, right? So we're, there's flooding, the price of rice is probably going up, and so the revenue is going up even as yields are going down. 
your revenue staying constant even as you get to point down. The other thing we see is that households um, seem to convert to fishing or invest more heavily in fishing um, when uh, when there's uh, good rainfall. So they, um, Households seem to increase their fishing during floods, right? Um, and the effect is actually quite large, right? So there seems to be a large amount of switching from crop production to fish production. Then if we look at total household revenue from both crop production and fish production, we see that again it's decreasing in rainfall, but there's actually no significant of flooding or um, or temperature variation now um, in terms of total household revenue. Right? Suggests again that households are, are adjusting pretty well and right? coping pretty well, surprisingly well, uh, in my opinion. Um, soil salinity, interestingly here, um, decreases crop revenue but increases fishing revenue. Consistent with a lot of anecdotal evidence we've heard, um, where households are seem to be converting their land to sort of brackish ponds, right? maybe for shrimp cultivation or for saltwater fish, right? which is actually creating a lot of um, political discord in some areas, right? where some people who would like to stay engaged in rice production don't want any more saltwater coming in, whereas other people want to make the conversion into brackish water and and switch to, switch to fish production. So there's a lot of um, tension in some areas with that. Um, that skip this for now, I'm going after the migration part. Okay, so for the migration, again, we have the benefit of using um, this data from the Statistical Bureau that is representative nationally but lacks a lot of the detail that we would other, otherwise like to have. So it is representative, um, and we have a small number of socioeconomic and, and demographic characteristics. Um, but you know, the definition of migration is, is not ideal. Right? So it just records anyone who's left the household within the last six months, or has been away for at least six months, um, or who has left the household either um, due to, um, to marriage or some kind of displacement right, or, or um, separation, right? kids moving away. That's it, sort of thing. it does not include any temporary moves. Right? I think there's a big caveat here and something that we would like to look at in future work right, is how much of the migration that's being used for adaptation is just occurring in the short term. Right? <coughs> it rains this year, so I move away for a few months and come back right, versus permanently leaving. have information on migration by entire households, um, but there we don't have complete data. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And so we can't, again, we can't use this data to tell us anything about overall population change, because what we're just observing is people leaving households that remain intact. And we don't really see migration by entire households. We can infer it a little bit, but because of the sampling structure, right, they sample a thousand households, we don't know about how many households have moved out. Outside of that. So same kind of structure, we're just going to regress an indicator for um, migration on the same environmental factors um, and our demographic and, and socioeconomic controls. And what we see is that the likelihood of having an out migrant um, is again decreasing in rainfall. Um, although here we don't see um, any effect of flooding, but we do see this um, negative effect, or we do see that soil salinity reduces uh, migration. And so things that seem to be bad for crop production also seem to reduce migration. And this is the other narrative that's emerged in this um, research on environmental migration, is whether, in fact, a lot of these people that are environmentally vulnerable are actually trapped right, in these vulnerable areas. Um, okay. Um, which again could set it set us up right for a massive break, right? Where at some point things become untenable and everybody has to sort of. So, um, 
the, the relationship with rainfall. So it's nonlinear. Is that is that right? So I mean, above average rainfall would be good, but lots and lots of rainfall is bad. Sure. Yeah. So again, here you know, this is something that we've been trying to sort out, um, and I, I don't know for sure. And so we do have the measure of flooding plus the rainfall. So it seems like it shouldn't. It shouldn't be a, if it were flooding, we should pick it up in principle with the flooding indicator. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. It is sort of puzzling to me, actually. Um, so we do have all the, yeah, we have all the measures standardized, so they should be deviations from the mean. Um, but yeah, it is a bit of a, a puzzle. I'll, I'll Um, we can also look at people will report the reasons for migration. Um, so people report um, economic reasons, so either looking for work or moving for work. Um, in that category, we see similar but smaller effects. Um, and um, same for international migration. Okay, so that's kind of interesting there, um, and I was surprised to see that the effects were smaller. I would have thought that. You know, if it were this kind of environmental migration, that people would be leaving primarily for work purposes, and we would see a stronger effect there. Oh, the other thing I want to mention with flooding here, the other complication is that oftentimes flooding in this context, because it's a delta, if it, so one thing we haven't been able to distinguish is flooding from river flows versus rainfall versus seawater. So if it's from river flows, it's actually positive in a lot of cases, right? Because you're bringing new silt and nutrients down into the area. Um, so that may explain some of the difference between what we see for, for flooding versus precipitation. When we include migration by entire households in our measure, um, we actually see the opposite effect for rainfall. Um, and salinity now has a much larger negative effect. So it seems like you know, these households that move in mass, right, or in total, are more likely to be using, which makes sense, right, they're using adaptation or migration as their adaptation strategy, right? They're not messing around with changing their cultivation patterns right, or their agricultural practices, right? They're just exiting the area. So they're more sensitive in some sense to these um, climate measures. Um, but you know, I don't want to lean too much on these results because we don't have socioeconomic characteristics for these households that move in total. And so, I mean, we know that those characteristics are um, correlated with climate vulnerability. So we do have this was done by my colleague in um, sociology looking at the percent change in village, pop village level population, most of Bangladesh, um, versus uh, well, so what you can see is it's just it's kind of mixed, right? So some of these areas that are more subject to um, flooding have seen, you know, population decline in these dark blue areas right, that are around here. It's Chittagong, the second largest city, right, which has seen a big influx or big increase in population. Yeah, I feel like I'm not giving a very good punchline because everything is like we don't really know what's going on, right? It's so complicated. Um, which, so I'm looking forward to, to getting your feedback and, and thoughts for, for how we should move forward with this, right? Because there's also a dynamic elements of this that we're not capturing at all, right? That migration today reflects all the migration that has or has not occurred in the last, you know, 30, 50, 100 years, right? So how do we sort of bring that all, all together? Okay. Um, and in their regression analysis, they do find that um, the flooding index leads to a reduction in population over this 10-year period. Um, so yeah. um, in the future, just if we'd like to look at um, when we incorporate better knowledge of sort of agronomy and what climate factors really matter and a better understanding of how they're supposed to matter. Um, and I don't know to what extent we'll be able to tease out sort of Households changing their productive strategies, right? Their agricultural strategies versus the actual agronomic effects. Okay. And 
Um, I'm really excited about, um, I have a survey going on now in the field looking at temporary migration. So what we're doing is we're using a phone survey and we're calling households in Bangladesh um, and asking them every two months, has anybody moved out of your household or has anybody left for work? Where are they? What are they doing? Did you have experience any shocks that sort of um, precipitated this migration? environmental shocks we'll ask about. Um, so this is really meant to get at this question of is there this kind of high frequency migration that we might not pick up in traditional surveys, right, where you go every few years and you ask who's left, right, and we don't see all of this temporary migration that might be um, Another thing we've seen, this is done by our colleagues in uh, geography. Um, they People don't generally report environmental reasons um, for migration. Like they don't view it that way. And I don't know what, it would be interesting to see what the perceptions of climate change are in this context, or even in our own context, it would be interesting to see what percent, or it is interesting to see what perceptions of climate change are, right? Um, even as I think you know, people are adjusting, I'm sure that much of this movement, right, to better employment opportunities is tied to climate variability don't perceive it necessarily in that way or don't um, answer in that way. I think there's a lot of questions too about them in terms of a, from a policy perspective, how we would adjust policies based on people's perceptions of changing environmental risks. Um, this is another thing we are potentially um, looking at being able to do. This was um, mobile phone data. So this is like um, big data. So this is just SIM cards pinging in different towers. This was during um, a cyclone. And so you can see these are, sorry. Um, the red shows an increase in activity and blue shows a decrease in activity. So it's just another interesting way to kind of track how population is moving. And you know, all this suggests that there's just a lot more mobility of phones at least, right? during these kinds of events that we would pick up from surveys that come in sort of after the fact. Thank you very much. <laughs> so going back to your slide uh, with the map and with the percent change of people moving, mm -hmm. is that just um, overall percentage change or do you also have data on where people are moving? So for this one, we don't. So this is literally just looking at census data, and they look at the number of people in a village. Okay, but for your migration data, do you know where people are moving? We do. Have you considered doing a spatial analysis and then looking at it with like a spatial lag or an error and seeing if that maybe might yield more significant results? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. a great idea. We're definitely thinking about that. And even to, to look at whether people are actually moving to less vulnerable areas. Right. And, uh, yeah. And my question sort of relates to that, and it's two parts. Two part. <laughs> um, a question about the temporal scale and the spatial scale of your analysis. So, I mean, coastal Bangladesh is being characterized by livelihood precarity for over 100 years, right? So, how can you correlate any of these changes to, uh, I mean, in other words, these are populations that have multi-generational lived experience of the care, mm -hmm. environmental, social, whatever. So I wonder how you say, sort of say with confidence that the responses you're seeing are necessarily due to um, today's environment. I mean, obviously the lens is we're crazy about climate change, so we're going to look at this through climate change lens. But in a place where everybody's always been fighting terrible odds, why, why should they think how come it isn't a bunch of other things? Right. Yeah, no, I think that's a totally fair point. And I, I don't know actually what the, I mean, we could go to more kind of an event, a scenario analysis type of thing, right, and look at events like the cyclones, um, which, you know, the, if they're more extreme, maybe it'd be easier to attribute them to, you know, attribute migration patterns or whatever to an extreme event. Um, but I don't. Yeah, I don't know. You have yeah, and it's kind of related to the scale or the spatial scale because, for example, when people say that um, they, they don't say it's climate change, they say it's job opportunities. Do you have any sense of uh, investments in education or job opportunities at the national level? 
national level? In other words, are you complementing this with national scale data that would signal maybe things that would not just be pushing people out, but drawing them into the cities? Yeah, we haven't yet, but that's the other thing oh, we certainly could include, okay. right? Or, and should include, right? Our, so we do have information on wages in sectors and cities, um, and we could look at employment levels or employment rates in different sectors and cities. Um, yeah, so I think that would be the other component to add, because you're right, a lot of this, I mean, crime has actually just been growing like crazy right over this period too, so it'd be natural to see people moving out, or natural to see a larger response, right, during this period because of the cities. 